Hi, it's Miss Moskowski here, ready for uh, chapter 11 of the Face on the Milk Cart. And when we finished chapter 10 last night, um, Janny and Reeve were on their way to New Jersey in his car after cutting school. And so we're going to start with chapter 11. It's cold out, it's windy, I'm looking very quarantine -y today. We're going to keep going. Here we go. They spent two hours on the Connecticut Turnpike. Janny read every blue and white highway sign if, if, as if it were an immoral, sorry, as if it were an immortal literature and she was going to be tested. On the New York Thruway, they paid a toll and turned north for White Plains, where they headed for the Tappan Zee Bridge and crossed the Hudson River. The river was very wide and flat, the same gray color as the sky. A single barge floated downstream. All that water, thought Janny, and no traffic on it. It's gonna blow over. She stared at the apartment buildings and houses on the riverbanks and pretended to choose a place where Jane, J-A-Y-Y-N-E, Johnstone would live. Jane Johnstone. She had planned Jane to be a mysterious and sensual and full of flair. She had always thought of mysteries and exciting curtains to be tugged aside and reveal intriguing pasts, but her mystery was sick and vicious. She was even now driving on that very road that Frank and Miranda Javinson had driven down when they made their horrible decision to replace Hannah. So right now she's thinking that her parents kidnapped her. Had they ever talked about it out loud? Ever said to each other, why don't we kidnap somebody? Or had it just happened on its own accord without plan and then somehow had seemed right to them instead of hideously, evilly wrong. Janny said, Reeve, it's impossible. Janny held up the milk carton. I see the milk carton, said Reeve, but that isn't you. How could you recognize you after all these years? I don't recognize me. I recognize my dress, Reeve. This dress is in the attic. It's Han in Hannah's trunk. Come on, there must be a, a trillion polka dotted dresses that little girls wore once. My sisters probably wore that stuff, so no big deal. It is a big deal, Reeve. She could feel that Reeve wanted to drive 100 miles an hour and was angry with the traffic and the law for keeping him back. And who could the Spring family be, demanded Reeve. Maybe it's a conspiracy the Spring streamed up to destroy your mother and father. They go to prison, you know, if they really kidnapped you. Reeve looked right at her, which they didn't, he said. Prison, another dark and vicious word. She had never seen a prison, except on TV cop shows. Her mother, strip searched, locked, and tormented. Mommy, Jane's heart cried, but out loud, she said calmly, okay, I've been studying this map in New Jersey. She was glad driving took so much of Reeves' attention. He did not have much turnpike experience. The heavy truck-filled traffic kept Reeves' eyes ahead on the mirrors, but rarely able to meet Janney's eyes. It's a good thing that gas station was stocked with maps. We want to get off at, in 17 more exits and then turn south. The town where the shopping center is will be halfway between. And what are we going to do when we get there, Reeve demanded. And she said nothing. She didn't know yet. Jenny, how am I going to explain to my parents where we've been? Why do we have to explain to anybody? Let's say we went, um, just driving around, killing time. We felt like skipping school. Reeve said uneasily, they'll figure out we had a motel room or a nice private beach. They'll figure it was sex we wanted, not getting out of a test or an oral report. Janny swallowed, normally a natural, unnoticeable task. Swallowing had become almost an athletic event. It's too cold for a beach, she thought. She pictured herself and Reeve on hot sand. Hot sand, nothing but a string bikini between them. She said, it's a long way. New Jersey is a much bigger, bigger state than you think it is. A double truck passed them, spraying such a puddle of water over the windshield that they were blinded, and for a moment they were isolated as if they were trapped in a tin can. Reeve turned the wipers up to high. The water was whacked away. Though nobody else is interested in sex and romance, then you would be hard to imagine, Janny. You're a little scary. You're like this hard, sharp, pointy thing. He doesn't like me, thought Janny. I'm in the car with my best friend. I guess he's my best friend and not Sarah Charlotte because it's Reeve, I've told. He wants not to be here. He doesn't like this person in his passenger seat. I've got to find out, she said. Why don't you just ask your parents? Reeve, what am I supposed to say? Daddy, stop telling me these cute little stories about Hannah's childhood. Admit you kidnapped me. It would hurt their feelings. Reeve laughed hysterically, but Janny, if they did kidnap you, who cares about their feelings? I do. They're my parents and I love them. Reeve said, I think we're a little confused here. Well, wouldn't you be, demanded Janny. They drove on and on. New Jersey seemed to last forever. Signs for Philadelphia began to appear. That's Pennsylvania, thought Janny. She knew nothing of Philadelphia except the Revolutionary War and the Constitutional Convention. Now I'm sliding into a time warp as well as a kidnapping, she thought. I've lost my parents. I've lost my name. I'm losing my century, too. 
Bree found the silence intolerable. He began telling her more than he had e than she had ever known about his own childhood, about how Lizzie and Megan were so impressive in everything, music, sports, academics, even housework, how Lizzie and Megan were virtually an opposing team of two in the Shields' house household. Each demanded to get all the blue ribbons. How Todd, born the year between them, struggled endlessly to be seen and heard in that aggressive sandwich of sisters. How Reeve, born years later, had merely stared at all these super achievers, doing nothing much of himself but making the occasional Lego building or turning a TV channel. I live next door to them, she thought, and I hardly noticed. How much does anybody ever really notice? She found herself thinking of Sarah Charlotte who had not noticed any change in Jenny. Jenny's life had collapsed. Sarah Charlotte nevertheless telephoned each night, giggled each lunchtime, and did not notice. <coughs> Sorry. They had long since lost KC 101 on the radio. Reeve tuned endlessly, trying to find a station he would like as well. When he had nothing more to say, he turned the radio up so loud they could no longer hear the rain. Say something, said Reeve. It's this exit, said Jenny. Reeve turned to look at her for so long she was afraid they'd go off the road. Briefly, this seemed quite reasonable. Forget finding answers. Abandon life instead. He expected me to say something about his childhood, she thought, about all those painful confessions he just made. But I'm too deep in my own painful confession. I'm a bad person. I was a bad daughter. Because a good person, a good daughter, would have noticed she was being kidnapped. She would have remembered her real parents. She would have wept and sobbed and fought and tried to get to them. She wouldn't just trade them in, and certainly just not for an ice cream sundae. Jenny... What if we find these people, the springs? Her mind was so cluttered with confusion, she had not actually planned to look for the springs. She had planned to walk through the shopping center and see if it triggered any memories. See if she could find that stool in front of the green Formica counter. See if she could remember, instead, Hannah and the cross-country flight. Reeve got off the New Jersey turnpike. We're here, thought Jenny. Fear seemed to throw water up over her eyes the way the truck had thrown it on the windshield, and she was canned inside with fear. Spring is an unusual name, said Reeve. There might only be one Spring family in the phone book. For those that don't know, before cell phones, a phone book was how you found people's phone numbers. There was an international house of pancakes, IHOP, on the side of the road. Reeve swung suddenly into their parking lot and they jolted in the air as he leaped over the sidewalk. Let's have pancakes and think about this, he said. They could be home. We might find them. What are you going to say when you ring the bell? Hi there. Am I your daughter? Jenny shivered. I don't want to be their daughter. I want to be mommy and daddy's daughter. Reeve parked, opened his door, circled the car, opened her door, and took her hand. What a gentleman. She still had her seatbelt on and it jerked her back in. And when Reeve undilled, undid the seatbelt catch, Jenny began to cry. Don't do that, Reeve said, horrified. What else is there to do? She imagined herself at some unknown doorway, some unknown woman answering it. Would it somehow be Hannah, a 12 years older Hannah? Would there be other children? But years had passed. The high chairs would be gone. She crumbled against his chest. They stood in the rain. Jenny hugged his middle. He was more solid than she had expected, and she could listen to all his inner parts, his heart beating in double thumps, his lungs filling in rhythm with hers. Jenny, the thing is, I think they'd call the police. That's what I would do, Jenny. Think. Can you imagine the scandal? If you made all this up, they're going to put you in a mental institution and give you counseling and, shr and shrinkage forever. Your parents will be wiped out. Wiped, Jenny. Off the map. Reeve tilted back from her and held her face up in his wet jacket. Up off his wet jacket. He slid his hands back along her cheeks until his fingers were tangled in her hair. How would they face the whole town? All the soccer parents. All those volunteer ladies and say, yes, our daughter accused us of kidnapping her. He looked into her eyes and she thought, he loves me. She could actually read it in his eyes, but she didn't know what kind of love it was. Compassion, neighbors, older brother. Reeve tried to lead her to the restaurant. She remained rooted in that spot. So, he said, trying to kid around, not in the mood for pancakes. How about a cheeseburger? In the middle of reading. Sorry, it's Mike. How about a cheeseburger? I see golden arches in the distance. Jenny shook her head. Jenny, what if you're right? His voice was shaking. The police won't let you go back to your parents. Well, to Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, they'll... Reeve sucked in air. Something will happen. I don't know what. Social workers and newspaper reporters and TV cameras and... We won't actually go to the door, said Jenny. We'll just drive by. Reeve pointed to a telephone booth across the street in a mobile station. That's like a payphone. You might see him walking down the street. I don't even think they work anymore. 
They pivoted to face it, staring as if it was a great pyramid in Egypt. Then they got back in a jeep. Reef circled the ugly A-frame restaurant with its slick brown roof. Janny was gasping for breath. Her head hurt savagely. Her hands hurt even worse. She looked at them to see if she had slammed them in the door or something, but they were clasping each other so hard she was like she was trying to snap her own bones. She made herself let go. Reef crossed traffic and pulled into the gas station. He maneuvered until he had a passenger door right in front of the phone booth. She pried the book. The phone book. She prayed the phone book would have been stolen. But it was there, hanging in a metal case by a metal cord. Her life, her soul, her history, her genes. She got out of the car and stood against the rain. The rain was a known quantity. It seemed as safe as Reeve's chest. Then she went into the booth and looked up spring. There was one listing and one only. How ordinary it sounded, how suburban and middle class. Spring, Jonathan Avery, 114 Highway Avenue. She walked into the gas station. A youngish man in need of a shave and a good weight loss program sat in a filthy blue coveralls behind a greasy table and leered at her. She said, would you please tell me how to get to Highway Avenue? And for a moment, she thought he would refuse. That would be a sign, wouldn't it, that she was not meant to know? That even total strangers knew better than to let Janny Johnson near Highway Avenue. But he said, long way, baby. South on this road, about two miles left on Mountain Road. It's down Mountain somewhere. Read the street signs, easy to miss. Good luck. She got back in the Jeep, dripping wet, and Reeve turned the heater blower on high to dry her off. South on this road, she told him, Jenny, I think we should go home. He was white and pinched. I thought when you said skip school together, you really wanted to do something neat with me, Jenny. I didn't know you just needed a chauffeur for something like this. I don't want to be part of it. No matter how much you want to know, I don't want to know at all. I was thinking that you... He broke off. He was thinking that I liked him, she thought. I do like him. I adore him. Her head pounded on and on. She had never had a headache like this. Hammers and spotlights behind her eyes. She touched the cuff of his shirt sleeve where it stuck out of his jacket and then very softly and nervously touched the skin on his wrist. She traced his wrist on each side of his watch band. She wanted to kiss his wrist and the golden hairs that almost invisibly caught in the spiral tension of the band. If he had not been driving, she would have yanked him toward her and kissed him forever. Reeve said, Janny, in the leaves that day? But the part of her not suffering a headache and the part of her not aching with love and reading street signs. There's Mountain Road, Reeve, turn right here. They got caught behind a school bus. What time is it, said Janny, frowning. Reeve held up his wrist for her, uh, be, but she couldn't read upside down. Two o'clock, he said. They must get out early here. Two o'clock in the afternoon, she thought. We won't get home till after dinner. What am I going to tell my parents? They'll be so mad at me. They'll never let me. She had to take her hand away from Reeve's wrist and put it over her mouth to stifle her hysterical laughter. The yellow school bus stopped once, stopped twice. The third stop was for Highway Avenue, the 100 block. Ooh, that's the block. It was a development, perhaps 20 years old, mostly split levels with identical front bay windows, opening to pleasant yards and thick shrubs. Each house had a two-car garage and most had hedges between them. The similarity among the houses with rat was rather comforting, as if it were a neighborhood where you could predict what would happen next and be safe. It had momentarily stopped raining. Enormous puddles attracted the children as they leaped off the school bus. The boys jumped square into the puddles, soaking their sneakers, splashing mud on the girls, who screamed happily and threw things like lunch bag apples they hadn't eaten. Reeve stopped the Jeep while the children crossed the street. Two boys, about sixth graders, went to number 114. Spring, Jonathan Avery, 114 Highway Avenue. The boys had red hair, the color of Janny's. She subtracted the years she had been gone. Had they sat in high chairs in that kitchen while she spilled milk on the floor? We had a dog, thought Janny, flashback. A big dog, yellowish. I used to hug the dog, and she'd lick my face, and my mother would yell at me. Honey was the dog's name. The front door of number 114 began to open for the red-headed boys. They were not latchkey kids. Somebody was home to welcome them. The inner wood door was bright red. A hand reached to push open the storm door, and Janny covered her eyes and sank down in the seat. Drive past, Harry Reeve, drive past. There were too many children dancing on the sidewalks, wild with release from school. To drive too fast, sorry. He drove about 10 more houses and parked the car, and the woman who opened the door had red hair too, he said. It's not true, said Janny. She could not tell if she was whispering or screaming. Her skull was vibrating as if dentist drills had gone crazy inside her. I refuse to have it be true. Reeve, take me home. You were right. We have to make up a good lie. We can't tell anybody about this. 
From the other direction came a second yellow school bus. It stopped quite close to them in the intersection of the 200 block. It was the high school bus. A handful of teenagers got off, none interested in each other, going their separate ways, bored. A tall, skinny boy from whose right shoulder swung a nearly empty book bag and a pair of enormous sneakers headed toward them. Now those are serious feet, said Reeve admiringly. I hope the rest of his body grows to fit. Look at the size of those feet. Look at that red hair, thought Johnny Johnson. That's my brother. The boy never saw her. He checked out the Jeep. He checked out Reeve, but was not interested in the passenger. The sneakers hanging by tied lace banged his chest as he walked. She turned very slowly in the seat and watched him. He crossed the street. He glanced at the newspaper cylinder. He put his right hand on the fender of a parked car and used it for leverage to toss himself over a hedge. He leaped in the air to touch a sagging leafless branch of tree. The branch snapped back, snapped back and jittered. It began to rain again as if the twig had punctured a cloud. The boy went in the front door of number 114. The drive home took forever. They had not known that there was, there was this much traffic in the entire world, let alone New Jersey, New York to Connecticut. Reeve was exhausted. His hand gripped the wheel. His eyes started around. He would never have admitted it, but the pressure of the racing cars, the huge trucks inches away, the endless turnpike entrances where cars nudged his fenders trying to squeeze in visibly frightened him. Neither one had driven anywhere but their own safe, slow corner of the world. Janny kept looking at his watch. Should we call them, she said nervously. Tell our parents we're fine, but we're going to be late. Reeve said, well, if you can think of anything to say to your parents, go ahead and call. I'll stop at a McDonald's on the turnpike. But I know what my parents are going to think. They're going to think you and I went to a motel to learn about sex. My sister Megan did that with her second boyfriend. His name was Philip. My mother still gets a fever whenever she hears the name Philip. They crossed the Hudson River and hurtled on toward Connecticut. There seemed to be no way out of the traffic. It had a nightmarish, eternal quality. As though they might be doomed to race wheel to wheel with the rest of the world, never reaching any destination. Janny said, a motel. She tried to think in terms of romance, or at least sex, but they were certainly easier subjects than kidnapping and another set of parents, Spring, Jonathan Avery, whose family consisted of at least three brothers and a missing daughter. The radio brought traffic reports. Highways they had never heard were jammed for miles. Bridges they had never crossed were impassable. Alternative routes with preposterous names were suggested. Reeve's hand suddenly loosened on the wheel. If it's not too late, he said. For what? For the motel. Their speed in the lane never slowed. Nobody had heard of a 55 mile an hour limit. Anybody driving 55 would have been crushed beneath the wheels of a thousand automobiles each flattening them once more till there was nothing left on the road but the metallic gleam of a car that drove too slowly. She could touch him in places she had never touched another human being. She could lean on his chest, not covered by layers of wet jacket and button shirt. I don't think I could concentrate, she whispered, wetting her lips. Maybe if I concentrated enough for both of us, said Reeve. That's the end of chapter 11. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.